There are thousands of amazing reptiles you can keep in captivity, but some of them come with a jail sentence if you get caught. So today, let's go over the top five most illegal reptiles in the entire world and the five close substitutes that you can keep without getting in trouble. My name's Adam, this is Diamond. You're watching Wiccans Wicked Reptiles, stick around. Now I have done a few of these similar videos before, but there's two things I'm gonna do very differently this time. One, I'm gonna tell you about the legal counterpart to all these illegal reptiles, and I'm just going to clarify what I mean by illegal. Some reptiles you can't keep at all, can't be exported, you can keep in certain areas, so I'm gonna clarify as we go because it's really difficult to put a blanket illegal everywhere type reptiles, because those don't really exist. With that out of the way, I wanna say thank you to Audible for sponsoring today's video, and let's just start off with number five, bromeliad boas. Now, I got to see bromeliad boas in the wild when I was in Costa Rica last month, some of the coolest animals that I didn't really even know existed, like I had heard of them, but they're not in the pet trade really, so I didn't do too much research on them because, well, I didn't really know I was going to Central America ever to go find them. But what makes them super unique is they are tiny. These would actually be a really great captive snake because they're pretty hardy. Sure, they eat lizards, but you could probably get them switched on to rodents if you really tried. They like really beautiful bioactive setups, so that would be perfect for them because, well, they're bromeliad boas, so they're found in bromeliads. They're found up pretty high off the ground, and they're really tiny. I'm talking really tiny. Now, there are other smaller type of boas, things like sand boas and things like that, but I think these look more like the common boas that you might see, more like a semi-arboreal BCI, BCC, it just really shrunken down. So that to me makes them way cooler than really anything else available. Now onto the legality of them. But to put it very simply, these guys, uh, some of them come in in things like banana bunches. A lot of people call them banana boas for this reason. So there are, is a chance that they could get shipped into North America or around the world illegally, but that really isn't illegally, it's just kind of an accident. And back in the day, like we're talking 20, 30 years ago, there were some imports from Nicaragua and Honduras, but now I don't know that there's any legal way to bring them out of Central America where they're from. So if you find them in captivity, it would be ridiculously rare, like so rare, I've never been able to find one. So the price tag would be so high that it would be like, it wouldn't be really realistic for any normal person who doesn't have funding from a giant corporation or who is really rich, to be honest, to have. So although they're not illegal to own technically in places like the UK and North America, parts of North America, they're just so impossible to find and they're illegal to import that I think they qualify as an illegal pet, illegal reptile. So what can you get instead? Because I kind of rambled on a lot about these guys. What I would recommend is something like a pygmy python. Now, I know I talk about them a lot, but I, I can't think of anything really that it makes sense here besides that, because pygmy pythons are semi-arboreal, just like the bromeliad boa. They're going to eat very well, which makes them a great pet. They look sort of kind of similar, not really, but as similar as I can find. I didn't want to pick a colubrid or something like that. I wanted a constrictor. And these are a python, not a boa, but I think that would be your best bet. I'm not gonna ramble on too much about them because we talked about them last week and 400 other videos. There's a video right here if you wanna know more about Antaresia, pygmy pythons and things like that. Number four, a very obvious entry with a not so obvious substitute, crocodilians. I don't need to ramble on about why crocodilians are illegal in many places. Now, this changes. Most places, I would say most probably, they're illegal. I know in most parts of Canada where I am, they're illegal. In most parts of the US, at least without a permit, they're illegal. So they're illegal basically everywhere and more places uh, you can get a permit for them, but even then I would call them illegal. This is because they're big, they're dangerous. Like, do I really need to go on? Like everyone knows what a crocodilian is, right? So instead of getting something that might get up to 10 feet or larger, depending on the type of crocodilian, why don't you get something that is kind of similar, has the same sort of scalation, but only gets to 10 inches? We're talking about red-eye crocodile skinks. These are some of my favorite animals that I, I just don't have room for in my own collection, but I love watching channels like Reptiliatus and watching his collection of them because they're so unique. 
They're so special. They look interesting. They have an interesting coloration of their eyes. Their scales look very crocodilian-esque. Their head shape is very unique. And they're just a unique lizard. I mean, these guys, they're going to rear their babies, which they have one at a time, one clutch, one egg, and they're going to rear the baby. The baby is actually gonna eat the poop of the parents, which is, anyway, neither here nor there. I just think that if you want something that could fit in probably like a 40 gallon enclosure, rather than a 4,000 gallon enclosure that you might need for a crocodilian, you could have these. And they like it really humid, and they like kind of a, not a, the same sort of environment, but you could set it up similarly in a micro type way to the way that you might keep a crocodilian if you had a giant yard, a giant enclosure for something like that. So, I mean, I'm hoping I'm not stretching too much. Let me know in the comments. Was this a good one or? I don't know, let's move on. I love making YouTube videos about reptiles, but sometimes I need to get out of my own head and take a break, and for that, I use Audible. Audible is the number one provider of spoken word entertainment. Whether you're into fantasy books, business books, trying to be motivated, or just find binge-worthy podcasts, Audible has you covered. What I really love about Audible is every single month, as a member, you get one free credit. So you can download a book, even from the premium category, and it's yours forever. Audible is basically just everything you love to listen to all in one place, from books to podcasts. If you're a lover of audiobooks, Audible always offers a 30-day risk-free trial, so it's always great to start. I personally just got hooked on a new book that I started, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. It makes me feel much more motivated, and that's the idea of the book. It's not only written by Stephen Pressfield, but it's also narrated by him as well. It gives a certain connection to the book, to the words, and gives it a little bit more meaning, a little bit more life. And this book, which was originally made for writers, translates really well to content creators just like me, or if you're an athlete, if you're a da whatever it is that you do, you're going to feel a, a new sense of motivation and it's going to help kill that procrastination that might be setting you back in whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish in life. And the new plus category on Audible gives members even more value in their membership. This way you can discover maybe new podcasts you wouldn't have given a chance and new favorites in audiobooks as well. So whatever it is that you're into, if you're taking care of your reptiles, taking a break, editing photos, you're out exercising, whatever it is you're into, an audiobook always makes it better for me because right now you can get 60% off making it only $5.95 a month for your first three months with code Wicked Reptiles. For more information, go to audible.com slash Wicked Reptiles. Now, let's get back to work. Number three, and one of my personal favorites, huge constrictors. Now, we're talking about a bunch of, it depends what you mean by huge constrictor. In my opinion, things like reticulated pythons, Burmese pythons, African rock pythons, even things like really large BCIs or BCCs, so boas is what I'm trying to say here, and other species as well. So it just really depends. This is kind of uh, objective, depending on what you decide is a huge constrictor, but places like Florida are going to have laws in place against reticulated pythons, berms, things like that, because they are going to be invasive. They're invasive in Florida. So they don't want any more being housed and then let go or whatever. They're in, the other reason that you're gonna find these are illegal in a lot of places are because they're dangerous, although they're not really. In the last 30 years, there's been something like 10 confirmed deaths by large constrictor, and I personally know of most of these. I can find most of these and knew what they were off the top of my head when I looked up the number, and most of them are like neglectful. They're negligent. These animals are not really dangerous if you know what you're doing, if you have half a degree of common sense. There's a video I did right here all about what I mean by this. And in terms of legality, some places are going to say you can't have a snake over this length. A lot of it is like two meters or three meters. Those are pretty easy, so six foot, nine foot, that type of thing, 10 foot. Which, I mean, makes sense that anything over 10 foot, you should have another person in the house and maybe a permit, either, my opinion doesn't matter. I'm just giving you the facts here. Some places are actually going to name the species. So no uh, Burmese pythons, reticulated pythons. And the issue with that is that rules out my substitute because my substitute are the smaller versions, the dwarf versions of the larger versions. So things like Burmese pythons and reticulated pythons and even boas have dwarf versions of them that don't get huge. For example, reticulated pythons can easily and often exceed 20 feet, but a super dwarf reticulated python is going to be, you can get them under 10 feet, especially as males. So with that in mind, that's like half the size. And if you get a male that's tops out at say seven feet, eight feet, 
it's a more manageable size for one person to handle. So in the case where your municipality, area, state, whatever, says you can't keep anything over 10 feet, for example, and that's all it says, blanket statement. And if you want a Burma or a Retic, you can get the Dwarf or Super Dwarf version of them, right? You can go to someone like a Reach Out Reptiles, they specialize in Super Dwarf uh, retics, or if you want a Dwarf Berm, Chuck Royal does those. So there's a bunch of different places that you can go. If your municipality, city, state, whatever, says no berms, no whatever, right? Names the species then your best bet might be to get a boa, a dwarf boa, because you can get things like hog island boas, which are gonna be four or five feet, somewhere around there. They can get a little bit bigger sometimes, but you have those options. And this is a great option too, if you wanted something like an anaconda. Now, green anacondas and yellow anacondas are big, and a lot of places ban them. So if you want a boid, something in the boa family that isn't illegal, you're probably gonna have better luck finding a boa species that isn't against your laws or bylaws. And they're less of a handful because, I mean, a green anaconda, no matter how you slice it, it's the heaviest bodied snake in the world. They get huge. So if you wanted something like even a regular BCI that might top out at eight feet, a regular uh, boa constrictor imperator, a common boa, that might top out six to eight feet, maybe 10 feet. It's just more reasonable, and they're gonna spend time in the water if you give it to them, and they're semi-arboreal. So in my opinion, that's, that, that's, that's, my, that's my opinion. On, on that. Number two, oh, we gotta ruin the list with an amphibian, hellbenders. So a hellbender is a type of salamander. It is the largest salamander in the US, and that's where you're gonna find them, in parts of the US. This is a weird one, because there are several species or subspecies, however you wanna break it down. So for example, uh, Eastern hellbenders are considered not at risk, or they're not endangered anyway, basically. They're near endangered or near threatened. Where the Ozarks Hellbender, they are endangered. They've actually been listed as endangered. So in the wild, you can't touch them, you can't export them, you can't put them, uh, get them over state lines, you can't take them out of the wild anymore. So it's gonna be hard to keep them. So it just depends. And in some states and in some cities, just hellbenders in general are completely illegal to either own or to trade or to sell or whatever. Those laws always kind of were weird to me. It's like that here with cigarettes, for example. If you're over 19, you can buy them, but if you're under 19, you can smoke them, but can't buy them or sell. Like, you understand what I'm saying here? It's the same thing with these salamanders where you can own them, but can't buy or sell them. It's like, I think you have to rub a, a lantern and then a, a genie comes out and you make a wish for a hellbender. Like that's the only way to legally keep them. But either way, what I'm trying to say is it's going to be difficult in a lot of places to keep these legally or to even find them because they're pretty expensive to buy and they're pretty difficult to find in a lot of areas. And they get pretty big. I mean, 12 to 29 inches, most of them stay 12 to 15, but still it's a the fourth biggest salamander, truly aquatic salamander in the world. And in substitution, I was gonna say axolotl, but I mean, we're kind of stretching there. So I'm gonna say something we've never talked about on the channel, mud puppies. This is one of those that although an easy, easy pet, and I've talked to some people who actually have them, which is what made me think of this in the first place, I would recommend doing tons of research on your own. I don't wanna go in too much detail here. This is a top five video, not a, this is how you take care of stuff video. It's not a care guide. But mud puppies are really cool. They're a very interesting type of animal. You've seen them definitely all over the place in documentaries, or if you live in the US, you've probably seen them there as well, just in the wild. But I think that, in my opinion, would be a better option if you're looking for something like a hellbender. Number one, something I'll probably get some pushback on, but you knew had to be on the list, Komodo dragons. Now this is a weird one because there are accounts or YouTube videos about people who have them in private collections. How authentic this is, beyond me, because uh, the way that it looks, the way that the law reads is that you can't import them anymore, right? Because Komodo, the island of Komodo in Indonesia can't export them. And you do need proper paperwork in order to legally own them, which is hard for some zoos to get, never mind facilities, never mind personal collections. A couple absolutes here. They are an appendix one animal. So uh, wild caught animals are completely illegal for private ownership. Like there are no and ifs or buts about it. And then any animals that are produced in captivity, that's where the gray area starts, where you need paperwork to own them, but it's not illegal, that type of thing. But then again, if you have one that you own legally that was wild caught and you create a breeding program or you have a breeding program with captive animals, 
Like, are you really giving Joe Blow the opportunity to buy one for his basement? Probably not, and if so, it's going to be wildly expensive. And on top of that, before we get to the substitution, some places just full out ban reptiles that are over a certain length, lizards that are over a certain length, or monitor species in general, so, I mean, I would think they definitely fit. This has to be number one. So what can you keep instead that's kind of similar? Well, I guess it depends what you mean by similar and two different circumstances we'll uh, kind of allude to here or we'll explore. If your area doesn't outlaw monitors, get another big monitor. Get a croc monitor or get a water monitor or a black throat monitor, or like you get the idea. Now I'm not saying just go out and get one. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying do your research first and decide which one is best for you, which one would make sense for you to keep if you want a big monitor. Don't just go out and get one. Big monitors are for not for most people, to be honest. But what if you're someone like me who thinks varanids, monitor species, are cool and you want one, but you don't want a huge one because you don't have enough room or you just, you don't want to keep one for whatever reason. Why don't you keep something small like a Kimberly Rock monitor or better yet, an Aki monitor? Sure, Aki monitors aren't that similar looking in terms of Komodo dragons. I mean, croc monitors are probably the most similar thing, but not all of us have room for an animal that rivals the length of a Komodo dragon and has claws that could eviscerate you and pull out your insides without even thinking about it. Not that they would, like, I'm just saying that most people can't keep croc monitors, okay? Then a small monitor makes sense. Ackies are easy to find. There's a few different colors, reds and uh, yellows, and anyway, you get the idea. So I think that they are probably the best small monitor just because they're the most easily found. The diet is easy, the care isn't too difficult, and just overall, it's there's no barrier to entry in terms of monitors. If you wanna get a monitor, this might be the best one. But it's up for debate. And I wanna hear what you guys have to say. Do you like this list? Did you agree with what I said? Is there some that should've been on the list? I know we skipped over venomous snakes. That's a whole nother can of worms for sure. Let me know in the comment section below. And as always, a special thank you to the Patreon supporters. You guys are freaking amazing. You guys make things so much easier and so much more rewarding to share special content, extra content. You get discounts on the merch. You know about special projects. Oh boy, do I have some special projects coming up before the rest of the channel. And for as little as a dollar a month, you can be part of the Patreon club too. And I think we've rambled long enough. This is a pretty long video uh, because we do videos twice a week. That means that I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>